without further ado, I call upon Alim to present uh, experience of HFOV in preterm infants uh, for about 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Prof. Sam. Uh, I'm aware of the time. It's uh, we are uh, in the interest of time. I go straight to the, my presentation. Uh, from uh, the HFOV with the volume guarantee, we come to the, back to the basics of uh, a, a good use of high frequency oscillation in preterm infant infants. I thought I would share our experience uh, in high frequency oscillatory ventilation in, in, in preterm infants. I would, again, I would uh, straight away start off with a case history which we had uh, recently, just to illustrate you know, how uh, you know, uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation being useful in uh, respiratory management of uh, preterm newborn. High frequency has been used in uh, term infants more often, sometimes, you know, especially with meconium aspiration and the diaphragmatic hernia, surgical conditions, hydrops fetalis, uh, such condition, it's quite useful. Uh, uh, and uh, in preterm infants, we in our unit, we use it as a rescue mode. Uh, even though I have worked in units where uh, high frequency used as a primary mode of ventilation, and uh, I have actually experience of both, and uh, both works well. Uh, but uh, uh, in the absence of evidence, clinical clear superiority of a routine use of high frequency in preterm infants uh, as a primary mode of ventilation, uh, we use it more of a rescue mode. So this, this uh, infant, 26 weeks gestation uh, boy, uh, who was uh, with a birth weight of 730 gram, uh, uh, had an incomplete antenatal steroids, mother had a severe preeclampsia and they came in with uh, almost uh, uh, no amniotic fluid. Um, and she was referred to our high risk center from elsewhere. And uh, on presentation, he had a non-reassuring fetal status. So uh, the team, the obstetric team has to go quickly to do an emergency cesarean section. Um, so uh, given that background, obviously we expect uh, quite a significant lung disease. And uh, in fact, he come up with a quite poor respiratory effort in delivery room and he needed intubation in delivery room. And even with intubation within about three minutes, he was intubated uh, uh, with a good, uh, you know, a position ET tube, but he still have a poor oxygen saturations. So he required quite a high inflation pressures in the delivery room up to 24 to 26 uh, centimeters of water with up to 100 percent oxygen in the delivery room to get a saturations of 80 plus in the delivery room then he was brought down to the neonatal unit but uh, his uh, uh, oxygen saturations dropped down to 50 to 60 even with 100 percent oxygen uh, so uh, his peak inspiratory pressure has to be increased up to 28 uh, you know during stabilization and uh, there was a chest transillumination done, which actually uh, did not show any pneumothorax. And uh, with uh, good inflation, uh, uh, with a conventional ventilation uh, in the delivery room, he had a gradual improvement of the oxygen saturations. And uh, the uh, SpO2 stabilized around 80 by 50 minutes of age. Then he was transferred to NICU by 8, 20 minutes of age and uh, given surfactant soon after transfer. So on the right hand side, uh, we can see the X-ray, even though it is a rotated film, it uh, shows a quite uh, you know, significant lung disease, severe HMD, with also possibly a hypoplastic lung. The, there is often a crowding of the ribs, uh, very underinflated right lung uh, with a more horizontal placement of the ribs. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, his uh, subsequent respiratory progress. Uh, so he uh, had a first blood gas was a severe respiratory acidosis. In fact, the carbon dioxide is uh, uh, beyond the uh, measurable range of the machine high. So uh, the peak inspiratory pressure at that time used was about 22 because after seeing the X-ray because of the, after the surfactant as well, because of the fear of uh, an pneumothorax or air leak, uh, I think the team were quite uh, uh, worried about giving a high positive end, uh, inspiratory pressures peak inspiratory pressures. So even with the increasing PIP up to 24 with a PEEP of six, uh, the, with 100% oxygen, there is a slight improvement in oxygenation. The uh, oxygen PO2 come to 96 millimeters of mercury, but uh, carbon dioxide still uh, beyond the measurable range. Um, so uh, the peak inspiratory pressures were increased up to 24 over six. And uh, also, uh, initially, the team thought that may be a bit of a secretions blocking, so airways were cleared. 
and but despite that uh, there was no uh, improvement in the hypocarbia so there is a mismatch between oxygenation and ventilation even though he requires a high uh, fraction uh, of oxygen uh, but he got a decent po2s uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately his co2 is still difficult to control at that point uh, you know we have switched him to high frequency ventilation uh, high frequency ventilation the mean uh, initially was start off with the mean airway pressure of 12 again a slightly lower mean airway pressures were used uh, because of the fear of air leaks in a uh, thought to be a hypoplastic lung uh, with the amplitude of 20 with the frequency of uh, 13 hertz uh, with a fi out of 0 0.8 his uh, co2s are still in 80s there is a gradual improvement in the ph uh, but uh, co2 is still high and uh, then uh, the high frequency amplitude was increased uh, initially to 22 which was not reflected there 22 and frequency was also reduced down to 12 and even with the frequency of 12 and 11 uh, with the increase in mean airway pressure for more recruitment of the more lungs uh, despite that the co2 are still in uh, 80 to 90s and only when the frequency was reduced even amplitude with, even with amplitude of 30 the frequency high frequency uh, until hfo frequency was decreased to 9 hertz then we were able to get a, a co2 which is in the normal range so this gives an uh, x-rays and uh, initially the first hour x-ray shows uh, uh, quite uh, underinflated lungs and uh, even with the lung there is some opening up of the lungs after surfactant and uh, on a conventional ventilation but despite that the co2s uh, haven't come down but there is a gradual uh, increase in the uh, mean airway pressure as well as with uh, decreasing frequency there is more opening up of the lungs and then the about four to five hours of life we are able to achieve a good control of uh, CO2 elimination. So th this is an example of uh, how uh, high frequency uh, can be quite useful in the newborn, uh, especially in the premature newborn. So the common uh, indications what we use in high frequency uh, in premature infants is uh, 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 in severe respiratory distress syndrome like uh, I have mentioned before and also in pulmonary hypoplasia. This infant actually the one I have showed have improved uh, with ventilation alone without any uh, you know any adjuncts uh, pulmonary vasodilators such as nitric oxide and the other situations uh, where hfov is useful in premature infancy is air leak syndrome especially uh, recurrent pneumothoraces and uh, pulmonary interstitial emphysema uh, rarely uh, even in premature infants we do see sometimes meconium aspiration or congenital diaphragmatic hernia or like prof sam mentioned the post nec surgery uh, in these situations, uh, especially when you have a high ventilator requirement, we find uh, HFOV uh, quite useful in achieving a good oxygenation as well as ventilation. Uh, the initial frequency, the HFOV settings we use uh, depending upon the gestation. In a premature infant, uh, our starting frequency is uh, 12 to 15, but we sometimes, depending upon the situation, uh, we use frequency between 10 to 15 hertz but in that uh, particular example i have seen is an exception actually we rarely have to go to frequencies of less than 10 in a premature infant uh, that's why the team have tried that infant uh, with a higher amplitude first and uh, use a frequency as a last resort as our previous um, uh, speakers mentioned the mean airway pressure we use a, a ie ratio one to two with the mean airway pressure uh, two to three centimeters above what we use in conventional ventilation when we switch conventional ventilation to high frequency and amplitude is actually approximately uh, the initial starting amplitude will be twice the mean airway pressure but uh, we always judge by uh, chest oscillations you know enough to get a good chest oscillations uh, with these initial settings uh, uh, you know we have to immediately follow that by a blood gas and uh, the, then adjust sub subsequent settings based on the blood gas. So the, what's the advantages of uh, high frequency in preterm infants? Uh, so uh, like uh, Thomas mentioned in the first slides, it can give a dramatic improvement in uh, oxygenation as well as the carbon dioxide elimination. And uh, it's very easy to overdo with high frequency ventilation. That's why we have to be extremely careful. If uh, I use high frequency, I put the high frequency and bring a chair and sit next to the baby and then just closely watch the babies, every single parameters, ventilators, as well as the uh, blood gas parameters. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, it causes a dramatic in effect in the lungs. Uh, yeah, yeah, Post yeah, primary you're, you're pathophysiology is uh, uh, decreased lung inflation. So oh, it is very good in opening up the lungs and me. recruiting the lungs. And also it improves the uh, ventilation at a lower pressure and volume, uh, less volume swings. And uh, it also provides a more uniform lung inflation and reduces the air leak. So this is the advantage of high frequency in uh, in uh, preterm infants, which is useful in, in infants who require a, a high ventilatory requirements. Uh, the other situation we find high frequency is useful is a persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, which often complicates severe RDS. Uh, it sometimes it can happen in the background of severe preterm pre labor of rupture of membranes and a pulmonary hypoplasia. Uh, in the PPHN setting. Uh, HFOV improves the lung VQ mismatch and uh, provide uh, improved blood gas exchange and also pro which provides a uh, pulmonary vasodilatation. Many times HFOV use alone uh, actually uh, improves oxygenation and sometimes can even avoid use of uh, uh, pulmonary vasodilators such as nitric oxide, which we occasionally have to use even in premature infants, especially with uh, pulmonary hypoplasia and the PPROM. Uh, the last slide, the monitoring is very, very important in HFOV. Uh, you know, if, uh, that, that's why the volume guarantee we were still not using because sometimes when I put a volume guarantee, people tend to have a tendency to uh, take, a, okay, the um, machine will take care of the amplitude itself, but uh, we still need to very closely monitor uh, all our ventilatory parameters. The clinical monitoring as well as sometimes we have to do X-ray to assess lung expansion. Uh, we have to do a uh, frequent blood gases. We mostly put a transcutaneous CO2 monitoring as well when we initiate a uh, preterm infants on HFOV. And the close monitoring of the blood pressure is very important. Uh, and uh, one last nurse lace is very important to keep the airways clear. HFOV is very oscillation dependent. And even a little bit of a secretions in the chest and the, and the kinking in the tube or kinking in the endotracheal tube, even the positioning of the head uh, loses the chest oscillations and sometimes you know, it can cause uh, CO2 increase. So it's very important, it's, you know, very important to have a, a, a maintain the good chest oscillation and keep the airways clear during HFOV. In what situations HFOV uh, has what is one limitations as well in preterm infants? One of the things I would be very careful uh, in using this airway disease. If you have an, a partial or a complete airway obstruction, especially in the setting of a tracheal stenosis, uh, which is rare in preterm newborn, in this or uh, uh, severe, you know, in these situations, uh, you know, uh, HSPOV can cause a worsening of the air trapping and it is uh, not the recommended mode of ventilation which we use, uh, which we would recommend. The second important thing is uh, when you have infant have a hypotension and shock and un uncorrected, uh, the HFOV use has to be very careful because uh, HFOV it's very easy to overinflate the lungs and affect the cardiac output, uh, decrease in the venous return, which in turn affect the cardiac output. So uh, we need to often monitor the blood pressure and also we have to, sometimes we may need to support the uh, circulation by giving a volume if we have to use the HFOV. Uh, with that, I would end my presentation. I thanks for the organizers uh, for the presentation. I would uh, hand my presentation back to Thomas for his uh, the last demonstration of the HFOV with volume guarantee. Thank you.